Good evening, everyone. Good to see you again this evening. Is God good to you today? Protected you as you traveled the busy highways and byways? Brought you here safely? Let's say praise the Lord. To those who are coming out for the very first time, we are very, very happy to have you. And I pray and trust that you will make a pledge in your heart of hearts not to miss another night. You only have like three more nights to go. And you have missed so much. And I know that the technology department of this church has uh, uh, done the programs already. The presentations are all on tape. So you can get a set and I'm sure they will give you a good deal. But also, I want to remind you, especially those who are coming for the first time, because you were not here, you would have missed it. But you don't have to miss it all, especially this CD entitled The Theology and the Psychology of the Touch. You need this for your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. This, believe it or not, can make the difference between success or failure in their social relationship. Trust my word on this. Okay? You need to get the CD, especially if you missed the presentation. And even if you ha heard the presentation, you need this on tape. Amen? Then, of course, I want to say a little more about the prayer and anointing service tomorrow evening. Don't take this lightly. Sometimes nothing happens. Because you are taking it too lightly. Okay? When God gives you something, he gives you for a purpose. And the scripture tells us that there are some things we can't get rid of. Except through prayer and fasting. And of course, anointing plays a part. Amen? And so tonight, I just want to put a word in. To come prepared, come early. We're going to have a wonderful song service and we're going to go right into that service of anointing last night we talked about the dangers of favoritism what a message that was and we are seeing uh, people are reaping all type of havoc as a result of misguided parents all right? And sometimes we recognize that we can love our children to death and even love them into hell. Okay? Misguided love. And I'm praying that the things you're hearing in theory, by the grace of God, you'll put them in practice. And you can be a chain breaker. Okay? The way you were raised and the things that you uh, were succumbed to, you know, you can change that. You don't have to perpetrate that. You can stop it in Jesus' name. Amen? All right. Tomorrow evening, the question will be answered. Where are the men? I am told that Saturday this time we'll be asking that question, where are the women? Okay, Friday we'll be asking that question because some of our ladies are going to this special uh, women's retreat over there in Innsbruck. It's going to be a grand time for them and we will pray for safe travel, amen? amen? But tomorrow evening, where are the men? It's going to be a very special message. So make sure your husbands are here. Make sure your sons are here. Make sure the boys are here. And, of course, you make sure you are here because you need to have the answer yourself because you may be surprised to know that inadvertently, inadvertently, some ladies could be participating in the elimination of our men. All right. Make sure you're here. We're going to have a rest on Thursday night, but we come back on Friday evening. The message will be parents... Your products are showing. Parents, your products are showing. And on Saturday, at the 11 o'clock hour, the auction block. The auction block. And I'm praying and I'm wrestling day and night 
with Saturday night's final message. I am praying over it, and you can help me to pray to see if I, the Holy Spirit will work with me to pull all the messages together in one. I've never done that before, really. But that's how he's talking to me right now, and I'm wrestling it because I'm scared. Okay? But I'm going to try by the grace of God if he continues to pull me in that direction. Amen? I just believe to have an in capsule form, pull all the messages together so that folks who have missed can get a taste of what, not only what they have missed, but could recognize that, hey, I may need to get these cassettes because it is so important. Amen? And so I'm going to try to do that in a bridge version in capsule form as we bring it home on Saturday evening. But right now, we're going to take some questions from last night night before the following night or any night or any question that is on your heart you can this is your time to ask your question who has the microphone the roving microphone is moving thank you very much i have two questions many years ago one of my friend asked me this question does god answer sinners prior and another question is if someone um break one the first one Let's take the first one. Does God answer sinners' prayer? I read somewhere in the scripture where two men went into a temple to pray. And I guess one was very learned. And the other one was not so learned. Uh, but they were both sinners. And this man, because he didn't have a vocabulary to pray long, he just prayed a simple prayer. Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. And the record states that God is intended to hear the long prayer. But that one he heard. But apart from that long answer, God says, I came to call sinners unto repentance. Does God hear sinners' prayer? Yes, he does. Back to that answer. I, I heard a preacher preach one time, and I, had, I told my friend yes, but after I heard this sermon, this preacher was saying that some place in the Bible, if iniquity is in your heart, God will not hear you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Listen carefully, listen carefully, listen carefully. A quo in the, let me not give you any Greek. If iniquity is in your, because we are so. sinful the Holy Spirit takes that prayer and fix it are you hearing me so he does hear our prayer but the question is the question is you are praying for God to bless you you're praying for God to do something special for you yet you are disobedient and you are scheming to kill somebody. If you regard iniquity in your heart, he can't do what he wants to do because God is God. And there are certain things that God cannot do. God cannot do certain things. What preacher? Thank you for asking. God cannot save a man against his will. God cannot save an unrepentant sinner. Okay? And God cannot lie. So those are three things that God cannot do. Because it's against his nature. Amen? Thank you for that question. Did I answer question number two? <laughs> okay. You still have time. I hope we didn't cause you to forget it. Question at the back. Uh, just a little follow-up, Pastor. Why is it when a person, could you just explain to us, I need to know. 
Why is it when a person is a saved person and when they turn back from the pathway? If God hears sinners prior, could you tell us why then they need to be restored by somebody who is in good standing? You want me to repeat? By somebody who is in good standing? Uh, I don't by, understand. The, by the pastor or whosoever. Uh, if a person is in the church and they are Christian, okay. and then they turn back from the pathway, uh -huh. they need to be restored. Restored by whom? By the church, the pastor. Okay, let me, let me fix it up for you. I know what you're saying. Okay, thank okay. you so much. <laughs> it's like somebody, no, let me fix it up. It's a very good question. What he's saying, somebody is a baptized member of the church. They turn back, they leave the church. Why is it that that person has to be restored? They left. Good question. Okay, let me fix it up. Christ referred to himself as the what? Husband man. The church is his bride. Now, there is no private marriage. There is private wedding, but there's no private marriage. So when you come to Christ, you are married to him. All right. When you commit spiritual adultery, listen to me now. When you commit spiritual adultery, it means that you have left your lover, who is Christ. And you go to mix with a harlot. You turn from Christ. Then you just want to come back like that. Uh-huh. Put it in perspective, preacher. So it means, therefore, you have to now show the world that you have left your old life of harlotry i'm preaching sabbath sermon and you have an you go back to your first love amen so you have to recommit that vow that's what it's all about that's you have to recommit yourself to your lover you're so you're fortunate he takes you back if that's the least you can do to recommit yourself that's beautiful and he's willing to take you back amen but there is another part to it you can turn from your first love without publicly leaving the church every time you sin you actually betray your first love or your lover and so the communion service now in the church takes care of that. Are you with me? So when you take that communion service, you need to pray a prayer of forgiveness. Ask God to forgive you and cleanse you so that you can continue to be right with him. Amen? Thank you. There's a question over here. Good night, Pastor. Good night, sis. I would like to know, is anything wrong with having a little bit of wine? Having what? A little bit of wine. A little bit of wine. Yes, sir. You mean the alcoholic wine. Listen to what the scripture says. The scripture yes. says, wine is a marker. You know what that means? It means that you take a little, you're going to want a little more. And a little more. And a little more. You know? So if you are genuinely saying, What's wrong with a little tip of wine? That's not what the Bible is talking about. That is dangerous. The danger is not that it is wrong, but if you touch it one time, it's going to tease you to want it another time and another time and another time. The reality is some of you are taking medicine and drinking more rum than ever in your medicine. Yes. I'm just being practical. Yes, but I want to know, is anything wrong with a little bit of wine? Like in the Bible says, a little bit of wine is good for the stomach. Okay. All right. Listen carefully. You're missing the point. Don't miss the point. Don't miss the point. We presented a message that is on tape. Going back to this. And we call it the theology and the psychology of the touch. And we point out to people that what one touch can do. What one touch can do. And so one touch 
can affect your mind. Okay? And therefore, if you take that sip, the danger is, the danger is you will want to double up later on and it's best to avoid that temptation. All right? And that's just it. All right? So therefore, 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 if you want to be heaven bound, there are people who smoke and hide. That's up to you. You want God. There are people who drink and hide. You want God. At the end of the day, I tell people all the time, and I'm not afraid to say, it, I am not going to waste my time playing church in church when I could go live and carouse and have all the fun out there. It makes no sense. So if I want to be saved, I'm going to play it straight because I'm not going to spend all my life in church and don't make it to heaven. It makes no sense. Get real. I'm just giving you the facts as they are. I'm just giving you the facts. They call it the naked truth. Go ahead, sis. Uh, could you then just explain the wine that Jesus was talking about when he said, if you take a little wine? Because sometimes we get confused about the alcoholic wine that is being sold and the grape juice that the Lord is talking about in the Bible. Could you just explain well, that? Well, in scripture, in scripture, listen carefully, in scripture, wine was really grape juice. Okay? But you've got to understand, I'm, I just give you the facts, okay? Sometimes you can't handle the facts, okay? But later on, like, you know, Father Noah, Father Noah discovered the fine arts of making wine from his grapes. You see, after, after, after the flood, before the flood, you know, Noah was a sheep herder. After the flood, he became a farmer. And among the things Noah planted was a vineyard. Are you with me? I'm just giving you facts, okay? So Noah was playing with his grapes. And he discovered the fine arts of making grape juice. And he discovered if you keep it for a little while, it, it becomes, you know. So one day, he was experimenting with that thing. He took a cup full and he felt no pain. It teased him. He took a jug full and he started to laugh and dance. It's like he took a jar full and he flipped high as a kite. Started to jump around. Noah took off his clothes. The man was drunk, naked. That's what it does. That's what it does. All right? At the end of the day, listen carefully now. At the end of the day, Christianity is about relationship. Relationship between you and God. Not between you and the pastor. Not between you and the church. Between you and God. And I always tell people, if after you hear the truth, you do contrary and your conscience sets you free. God bless you. That's straight talk, isn't it? The people who continue to ask certain questions is because they want to do it, but their conscience is bothering them. So they are seeking confirmation from somebody so that they can say, I was told it was okay. Do you know how many couples come before me, preacher? Do you know how many couples come before me? They make up their mind for divorce. They made up their mind for separation. But they hear that Pastor Cross is a good counselor. So they literally come to visit with me so that they can leave and say, we even went to Pastor Cross and it couldn't work. They made up their mind a long time that they're not going to make it. 
But they want, instead of being a man and a woman to own up and take responsibility for their own action, mine is well made up, they come to seek me out, and when I counsel with them, they'll go and say, not even Pastor Cross couldn't help. <laughs> but they've made up their mind. Come on, folks. Let's stop playing games. You know what is right. Do what is right. And I can't afford to gamble with half truth. I would rather do the old truth, you know, than to be told that, didn't I tell you? And then we're going to say, God, but somebody told me this. Uh-uh, it's there. Do it. It's better you do it and hear Jesus say, well, you didn't have to, rather than he says to do it and you have an excuse. I am what is called a practical religionist, not a fanatic. And I study the scriptures, and I study what is called the sipsum laban. What that means is the life setting. Life setting. And so when Jesus was at the wedding at Cana of Galilee, they call it wine. Do you think Jesus gave them liquor? No. He gave them wine. And that was the best wine. Amen? It's not one that is going to send them looking like nine when they should be six. Amen? And so I appreciate this question though because they are intelligent questions and they help other people who can think that you can just do a little bit of sin and it's okay. It's not okay. It's not okay because there is no half truth. Amen? God bless. Let us pray tonight as we get into tonight's subject. Dear God and the Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the way you have been revealing your truths to us. We are so grateful that you have touched the hearts of your people night after night and have been coming out in their numbers to enjoy and to receive your word. Thank you for the positive responses. Thank you for these very important questions that provoke our thoughts and our minds. And I ask, oh God, that your people will seek to order their steps and their lives to, according to the answers. Speak through me again tonight to the hearts of your listening people. And as I speak forth your words of truth and life, may self be crucified and may Jesus Christ and him only be lifted up and seen. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. We're going to turn to our screen tonight, and the subject, Lord, I prayed for a mate, and you gave me a snake. Lord, have mercy. Wow. Lord, I prayed for a mate, and you gave me a snake. A relationship may be clear as crystal, beautiful and joyous, but unless it is tested and tried, you will not know if it has stained power. Amen? We can talk all we want. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but a relationship will be tested. You will not know if your relationship can endure storms and hurricanes, hot summers and cold winters. Do it right and be sure because if Christ is in the vessels, you can smile at the storm. The devil sends the test to separate and to destroy you, but God allows them to encourage and strengthen you. God will not allow any trial, God will not allow any test that is beyond your capacity to succeed. Every strong relationship have passed through test and trial. Won't somebody say amen? If you give your relationship the chance, therefore, if you give your relationship the chance it needs to be tested and tried over time, you will not end up with a snake, but a real mate. 
There is no relationship that is a one-way street. The very word relationship means that at least two people are involved. So it takes two to make a relationship work. It takes two to make a marriage work. Your mate, one who will help you to hold up your religious values. So you need a mate who is a Christian. One who is going to help you to live out the oracles of your faith. So if you marry someone who don't think like you, don't worship like you, it's going to be hard for you to make it difficult. Because you are struggling with your own weaknesses and you are carrying her weaknesses and are his weaknesses too. And you are a human being. How can you cope? It's difficult, saints. So you need a mate. A mate who will love you for who you are. There are too many people who get married and are not satisfied with who they are because the mate is not satisfied. So don't get married if he does not accept you for who you are in the first place. Don't marry her. Don't marry him if you have doubts. And we go back to what we said last night, therefore, don't marry on the installment plan. Does not work. You know the man drinks and he drunks and he, and, and, he, and he curses and he may get abusive. You know that. But apart from that, he is almost perfect. But you overlook that. And when you get married, you are bugging him to change. Doesn't work like that. So you need a mate who will not criticize you for every mistake you made. You are not perfect. And you will make a mistake today. And you will try not to make the same mistake again, but next week you may make another mistake, a different one. And therefore the wise spouse will be happy to know that you are not making the same mistake over and over again. I am saying you should not make the same mistake more than three times. What am I saying? Did I just say that? I am not talking about sexual impropriety. There are some things that you do in your home. After you make it one time and you're cautioning, if you make it the third time, you are careless. You are not thinking I am saying that shouldn't happen three times and I'm saying this because every time people come for counseling over problems and bad habits and attitudes is a saying that pastor she just keep on doing it over and over again he keeps on doing the same thing over and over again how can you do that if you love the person so you remember the premise now, if you marry the person to make him happy, if you marry the person to make her happy, then you should not be repeating these mistakes two, three, four times. Am I right? Because the person is sad. All I'm saying here, stop being selfish. Because every mistake that is made is based on selfishness. Okay? Not ignorance. Selfishness. All right. We come up with all type of excuses, really. But sometimes you're going to do something and you know very well that your husband don't want you to do it. And you still do it. You know it's going to hurt him. You know it's going to affect him. And you still do it. Sometimes you're going to do things that you know the wife don't want you to do. And you still do it. And it's based on satisfying yourself for the moment. And couldn't care less. So you need a mate who will build and encourage you we are not strong people. Sin deform us. Sin weakness in every way. And therefore, we need to have people in our lives who will, what? Encourage us and build us. Amen? We need that. Everybody needs that. Okay. You need a mate 
who will recognize your talents. I am sharing this with you tonight because too many people are getting married just for love. And if you check the statistics, a lot of people who are getting divorced still love each other. So it means, therefore, there's something more to marriage than just love. So, as you seek out a mate, you want to make sure that you have one who will recognize you for who you are, recognize your talent. Every one of us have a talent. And it is nice if you are with someone who sees that talent and even though you don't see it in yourself, helps to bring it out in you. Amen? That's what it is. And you will love a person for that. Okay? So you need a mate who will focus on you rather than others of the opposite sex. In other words, this is you. And when they come to church, all they are talking about is the other sister. You are you. How does that make you feel? As if to say, he wants to change you overnight to be like. This is you. And all she talks about, why can't you be like elder so and so? This is you. So therefore, come out of the makeover business. God didn't pull you together for that. Okay? Believe it or not, there is a way you can make over your spouse. Or there is a way you can get your spouse made over. And it is a simple way. Just ask the Creator. It is not your business. And as a counselor, I tell lovers, I give them the cue how to do this. If you have a problem with your spouse, one that is really eating at the core of your heart, just talk to Jesus about it. But every now and again, if it is drawn out before it is rectified, slip off the bed in the dead of the night or in the wee hours of the morning. Tiptoe around to his side or her side. Kneel down close to her ears or his ears and pray to the Lord. Pray aloud. Pray audibly. And finish praying. But make sure in that prayer you are actually recounting how much you love him. How much you love her. But God, this attitude is killing me, Lord. I ask you to take it away from my loving husband and say nothing more. Take it away from my loving wife and you go back to sleep. You will be surprised what that will do. One wife responded to the husband. I didn't know that was disturbing you. Yes, it has been disturbing me for years. But I can't change you. So I'm asking God to. And because they married for love, that which seemed impossible became possible. Come on, saints, take it to Jesus. But you have got to be on speaking terms with him. Just know how to address God and talk to him. Amen? So you need a mate who is willing to change bad habits for you. Amen? You don't want to marry someone and, and, and because, of course, you weren't living with them so you don't know everything about them. No, you marry them. You are seeing some bad habits, some bad attitudes. Then if you marry because you want to make your spouse happy, then you just, in a loving way, talk about those bad habits, those attitudes, and you should be willing to change. Am I right? Be willing to change. Because some of the bad habits are not only offensive to your spouse, but they may not be healthy for you. You could have a habit that is going to kill you. Your spouse loves you. And so that spouse is going to be a little nagging or so on your case. 
Because the spouse wants you to stop what you're doing so that she can have you around longer. He can have you around longer. And you may get upset, but the fact is, it's because of love. It's not every nagging is because of anything else, but love, love, love. So you need a spouse who will recognize that. You need a mate who will protect you and stand up for you, especially when your back is turned. Defend your spouse. Speak up for him. Speak up for her. But don't condone wrong. Amen? And I'll tell you something, folks. If you are with your spouse and your spouse said something wrong to another person or to a group of people don't correct her don't correct him in the crowd when you go home you say honey you were dead wrong today and he's going to say, what? Yes. And you point out the error. Then you say, honey, you need to go and apologize. Let me tell you something. We follow that practice in our home. I have to apologize to my children many times. My wife would see me messing up with the kids, misjudging, and she would say nothing because we have that understanding. Don't put me down before my kids. We know that. So she waits. And she points out the error. And I, in my own time, not too long, go and apologize. The worst thing that you could ever do to your wife or to your husband is to stop him or her in her tracks, in his track, and say, you're wrong. And let the child hear that. You are killing him as far as future correction is concerned and respect for the children. So any party in the family who does something wrong, you correct it behind door and let the person who did the wrong go and make it right. A word to the wise is sufficient. Word is sufficient. So you need a mate who will protect you when your back is turned. You should have that confidence. You need a mate whom you can talk about positively without feeling ashamed. So come on. Every now and again, you can ask questions. What about me that you still like? What about me that you really love? And sometimes we can't come out with it fast enough to satisfy you. But the fact is, you should have something in mind. Amen? Should have something in mind. You need a mate with whom you can talk and laugh with on different subjects. Folks, there are a lot of marriage where the laughter is gone. No more fun. Life becomes dull and dreary. And remember I told you the only time some of you go out is when the church plans a trip. You cannot allow that to happen to you for heaven's sakes. Come on saints, we are Christian and the world should be pining after us with the way we live our lives. You cannot allow the wife to be very happy that she's a Seventh-day Adventist because at least she gets to go to church once a week. Because that's the only place she goes. You cannot do that. Find time. And, and, and wise, it's not where you go, it's the fact that you go. In other words, don't let the man feel that he has to take you to the Taj Mahal. This five-star hotel. He may not have it. But you can go out for a quiet evening, even for dinner.
It's a nice restaurant I was taken to, to um, two days ago. You want me to tell you about it? It's a nice restaurant, I'll tell you. It's called Sweet Tomato. I'm not promoting any, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not promoting anybody's restaurant. I'm not promoting anybody's restaurant. But, but I discover it's a safe place to go. You can eat safely, okay? All right? Those people need to pay me. I just got them good business. All right? But I'm just telling you, folks. I mean, and it's not expensive. Right? And I've been reading this stuff. If you're 55, you're a senior, you get this discount too. Yeah? Don't tell the brother that he's cheap. Just go and enjoy an evening out. Amen? And talk. Folks, come on. You got to promise yourself. Okay? Take time out to do this. And you will have fun and enjoy it. Amen? You need a mate who is sexually and emotionally satisfying to you. Amen? And therefore, you got to talk. Talk to each other. All right? Talk in your quiet time. Talk in your spare time. Talk when you are together about your love life. Talk, saints. You used to talk. So why aren't you talking now? So let's go back there. Amen? Good. You need a mate whom you are not afraid or embarrassed to go places with. There are some people who just don't want to go out with their spouses anymore. Why? Come on. Let me say this to you tonight. You are not the same person that went to bed last night. You've got to understand that every time you go to bed and wake up, you change. Change takes place. It's just that you don't see it happening. But over a period of time, change takes place. And it's not just your external features that change. Internally, you change. And a man needs to know that the wife he married at 20 or 25 naturally will change internally and externally. So men, every time I have my men's meeting, I help them to understand the idea of PMS. They need to understand that there are biological changes that take place in the woman's body that will cause her to answer you a certain way that you won't like. And one of those ways is, don't touch me. <laughs> you don't like it, but you must be smart enough to know what's going on now. What's going on now? Don't even ask her to explain it. You should know. You should know. And so there are a lot of people who get uptight with each other because the other one does not understand. That's what Peter is talking about. You've got to live with your spouse through knowledge. Study her body. Study her attitude. Understand her emotions so that you can live with her. Study his body. Study his attitude. Understand his mindset so that you can live with him. It's not easy, but it can be done. Amen? Because we can't read the mind. You can't read your spouse's mind. So if you don't talk, then your marriage and your family life is in trouble. Because you're putting your partner up now to guess. To guess. Say it. Amen. Ask for what you want. And the Bible says, the woman belongs to the man, the man belongs to the woman, and each one must render his or her conjugal rights. You can't withhold yourself 
You're not supposed to do that. It's not biblical. It's not right. But I always tell men in general that you cannot do something wrong and allow two days to pass and think that the wife forgets. You don't apologize and you expect her to be as nice as nothing happened. It doesn't happen like that. Okay? So you have to go back two days and fix that. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen? That's how it is. So you need a mate whom you can introduce to family members and friends alike without fear of being embarrassed. You shouldn't be afraid to take the man you are dating home. Because we are not talking about the late 50s and the early 60s. You remember the movie, Guess Who is Coming for Dinner? That's not what I'm talking about. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, Sidney Porte fell in love with a Caucasian girl. And he's talking on the phone to his parents that he's madly in love and he's going to take home the love of his life. Remember now, Sidney Poitier is a black man. So when he reached home, they were shocked and not pleased because the girl is white. And they were sending a message. That was just a movie. But the point I'm making, you want a mate that when you take her home, or take him home, you will not be embarrassed. I remember having to counsel with this young man and the mother, not the young lady, to comb this young lady from college. And when he passed through the room, the mother said, if this is only a weekend, can you imagine what your life going to be like? It was like storm passed through the room only for the weekend. That didn't work out because she embarrassed him. Amen? And then these are little cues that you have to look at. Look at. The mother was there cooking and doing dishes and they're talking and she stood there the whole time. I remember when I was a student in college, my president was the name L.H. Fletcher and he told us the story, a true story. He said he was washing his car one morning to drive into Kingston and a student came by wanting to get into a place called Spanish Town. And Elder Fletcher says, I'm the president of the college and I'm washing my car and I'm running late. I know I'm drying the car and the student stood up and watched me wash the car, dry the car, went in, got dressed, came out when he's getting in the car, he was hoping to go and said, where are you going? I came to get a ride, Elder. He says, not in my car. That was hard, wasn't it? But guess what? I got the lesson. I learned the lesson. At least let him say no. Couldn't you just offer to help a little? Elder, let me dry the windscreen while you go and get dressed. He stood there and watched him as he dried the car, washed the car, dried the car, and then he wanted to ride. Lord have mercy. These are just little object lessons. Object lessons. Object lessons. So you come home from work. The wife is in the kitchen cooking. Mm. Or you finish eating. And she's doing some other stuff. Just talk and wash dishes together. Just do, don't grow too, don't grow up so much that you start doing those things. I am telling you, problems come when you start doing things together, saints. 
do little stuff together and enjoy it. And you can even have fun gossiping together. Nothing is wrong with that. As long as it's not destructive, you can gossip and laugh. Just keep it between yourselves. Just have fun together. And you are never too old to give a good laugh. Have fun. Amen? Amen. Come on, saints. You owe it to yourself. I am going to close off by sharing six tests of love. Six tests. I'm going to go through them quickly because I don't want to cut these. Now listen to this. Old age is no excuse to allow your relationship and your marriage to become boring and lifeless. Old age. No reason. I want to share with you now six tests of love. Look at them quickly. Test number one is called a what type of test? Sharing test. Real love wants to share. Real love wants to give, to reach out. It thinks of the other one and not of self. So the first test is what? Are you able to share? Share. Folks, you can't be lovers. You can't be man and wife and you are not sharing. You've got to share. Amen? So that's the first test of love. Let's move on. The next test is the what? Respect test. There is no real love without respect. Respect. No real love without being able to look up to the other person for something. Mm? You got to look up to him. You got to look up to her for something. And you've got to have respect. Because if you don't have respect, then you're going to respond to her or to him anyhow. Not only will you respond to him anyhow, but you will respond to him anyhow or to her anyhow, even in the presence of other people. Because you have no respect. Be careful about those things. So the question tonight is, do you really have enough respect for each other? And you, you can pick up these signs and cues even before marriage, you know. Some of them develop in marriage, but you can pick up these signs and these cues. Are you proud of your partner? Are you proud of your partner? Then the third one is what? The strength test. And I received a letter from a worried lover. He had read somewhere that one loses weight if one is truly in love. And in spite of all his feelings of love, he didn't lose weight and that worried him. I'm here to tell you my friends that real love should not take away your strength real love should not cheat you of your appetite it should fill you with joy and make you creative wanting to accomplish even more don't starve yourself because you are in love with someone most times that's not love that's infatuation alright I am in love I can't eat where do you get that from <laughs> does your love give you new strength and fill you with creative energy and zest or does it take away your strength and your energy ah if your love is sapping your vital energy that's not love you are possessed with something else and it's going to kill you sooner or later when you love you have strength it invigorates you you want to get up and work you want to do stuff to impress the object of your love amen that's what it's about so we come to the habit test the what type of test i said don't marry on the installment plan that is to think he or she will change after marriage love accepts the other one with his or her what habits so our fourth test is a what serious one the habit test. Do you only love each other or do you like each other as well? Folks, I could spend all night on that. You have got to like the person. Every true love 
all true love must be an outgrowth of like. You can't love the person and then like them. You have to like them, then you love them. And that's why we say people talk about love at first sight is really like. Because the person walks through the door and you hear them say, from the minute I lay eyes on him, I love him. Uh-uh. The minute you laid eyes on him, you are attracted to him by maybe the way he dresses. And you liked him by the way he walks or the way he talks. That's not love. Come on, saints. And there are people who meet people in 24 hours and want to get married. The Catholic Church does that all the time. Okay? When a couple sits before me for their first counseling session towards getting married, huh, the first question I ask is, now that you are planning to get married, have you ever had a quarrel? Have you ever had a quarrel? And most times they'll tell me, <laughs> I'm saying, not just a casual difference of opinion, but a real quarrel. Fight if you please. Many times they would respond, no pastor, we don't quarrel. Sometimes we have misunderstanding, but we don't quarrel. We love each other. We'll get my answer tonight. My response to them would be, I am sorry. I can't marry you. You go and have a good quarrel and come back. Then we can discuss marriage. And that is not joke. That is exactly what I do. But you see, I quickly get to it. The point is not the quarrel, but their ability to what? Reconcile with each other. They must have the ability to make up when things go wrong. The ability must be trained and even tested before marriage. The quarrel test is the required premarital experience and not sex. The quarrel test is the premarital experience and not sex. Because you're not going to marry your twin brother or your twin sister. You are going to have serious, serious misunderstanding. And if you don't have the ability to talk and to reconcile, you have no reason getting married. Amen. So when I say, have you ever had a quarrel? I'm not sending them to go and fight. What I'm actually exploring is, you have been dating, courting for one year now. Are you saying you have never had a misunderstanding that somebody frowns? And if no, well, it's serious. I'm not going to say go and concoct one because if you concoct one, it's not going to be real. It has to flow naturally. It has to flow naturally. But these are the things that you need to look at. And so... I need to go one step further. So having a quarrel because you're going to get married is not a sign to run away from the lady. It's not a sign to run away from the man and say, we have, imagine we're in love and we're quarreling. We quarreled about this yesterday and, 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 and today he didn't call me all day. The question is now, it's the second day. How are you going to handle it? And if it is handled well, you are a winner. Amen. Tonight, as we look at these tests, just remember that hasty marriage won't work. You can't get married in four weeks. Four weeks? Huh. You're planning to get married just after knowing the person for four weeks? That's dangerous. How much do you know about the person is important. You will never know everything. And I wish I had the chance to give you a presentation called Take Off the Mask. Because masking is a protective shield 
that mankind develop like animals. Do you know that certain animals can change their color to match the environment? They do that for protection. So therefore, if a man really wants to win your heart and they know exactly what you like and don't like, they can mask and pretend to win your heart and to win your hand in marriage. But do you think they can wear the mask forever? No. It comes off after a while. Women can do the same thing too. You can wear the mask. That's not honest. And so you have to take off the mask. Be honest. Be yourself. Be true. And to thine own self, be true. Amen? Amen? And so therefore, at least one year, folks, give yourself at least one year before you get married. And when I say one year, I don't mean he is living in Canada and you are living in South Florida. And so you say, well, the pastor says for one year, so we are now courting to get married in one year. So after that, you come down and we plan it in a weekend. It doesn't work like that. You've got to be able to see each other. There's such a thing called body language. Understand her body language. Understand his body language. When he's in Canada and you are here, the only thing that you are learning is his voice culture. That doesn't work. No amount of picture that you send online will give you the true picture. Amen? So tonight, I just share with you these nuggets of truth. And you begin to realize there's so much more to building and creating a solid foundation for a successful marriage than what we entered into. But it's never too late to start to mend some fences. It's never too late. The only problem you will have as a married person tonight is if you are the only one hearing these truths. You will still have a problem, let's face it, okay? Because your spouse is not here, and if you understand the social analytical explanation for life, lovers seldom listen to each other. So how are you gonna talk to her and she's not here? How are you going to explain to him and he's not here? It's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. But don't give up. Because God hears our prayers. And he understands our hurts and our pain. And he will heal our brokenness. May God help us tonight. As we are winding down this week. I personally want to thank you for the wonderful support of coming out night after night. It's very encouraging. The pastor and I have been praying every night and, and thanking God. And as you go tonight, pray for me and pray for my family. Too. We're looking forward to a wonderful weekend. But this is only the beginning for Lighthouse. Amen? Amen. We have great prospects. The future looks bright. The devil is mad. But heaven is glad because Satan has lost a few more souls he thought he had. Amen? Amen. To God be the glory. Won't you stand with me tonight? I'm going to pray before we collect the offering. I just want to have a word of prayer with you. Dear God and our compassionate Father, we thank you for these timely counsels and reminders that you are sent to us again. Some of us, as we look back in our own lives and marriages, Lord, we recognize that so many links were missing. And now that we have reached this juncture and we are still together, we can only say what a mighty God you are. You love us. You preserved us. You have kept us. You have saved us. And we love you. Our desire now, Lord, is to take these gems of truth and we will package them in a way, Lord, that we can share them to our family members. 
parishioners, co-workers, and help them, Lord, to improve on the qualities of their lives and help them to recognize that the problems they are having and the difficulties, they can resolve them if they truly want to because there is a God who specializes in changing people. I commit this congregation into your care tonight. I commit the pastor, the leaders of this congregation into your care. I ask you a special way, Lord, that you will bless the pastor and his family. Give him vision of your eternal glory. And give him wisdom to continue to guide this flock. May the leadership continue to give their support unfailingly. Dismiss us tonight with your choicest blessing. Take us to our several places of abode safely. Give us a good night's rest. Wake us up tomorrow morning with the dawn of another day, invigorated, resuscitated, and revived. And then may we go to work, Lord, with tomorrow evening's message in mind. And may we come back and even pledge to bring a friend as we seek to share these great nuggets. Hear my prayer, Lord Jesus. Let my cry come unto you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. The offering tonight.